Hello everybody, my name is Pastor Sabun Wyatt Barry from Mary Science Lab and today we're going to be looking at the fourth lecture of history uh, and we're going to be looking at the history of space and space, space travel. Now, many, many years ago, in the second century BCE, uh, people from all around the world uh, sat on fields, looked at the skies, but nobody ever dreamed of going there. Now, let us begin. Today, we're going to be looking at the history of space travel, as I mentioned before. And the first uh, noted record is of the Ptolemy and the family of hmm, the family of Ptolemies. So, uh, if you don't know, the Ptolemyan family was full of a lot of murder between the family, so including fratricide, uh, sororicide, matricide, and patricide. Uh, you can go search those up because they're too gruesome for me to describe. And, uh, among many others. So, uh, however, the Ptolemies actually gave a little bit of scientific ideas. Though this may seem a little stupid today, uh, we look down on this as stupid, but the stepping stools we uh, used to look down on it were built from the exact same thing that we are looking down on. So, that's basically the history of all incorrect theories. Now, this, mm, I'm to push this notebook aside. So now, the Ptolemy's theories consisted of the Earth at the center uh, and all uh, celestial objects orbiting in a perfect circle around the stars. After all, they're heavenly objects. What else can they be except perfect? Uh, this definition of perfect was only diminished a few centuries later in the uh, 16 or 1500s. Uh, so, uh, this was uh, very uh, widely accepted at the time. Uh, and uh, of course, some ancient Greeks uh, suggested heliocentrism, but there was zero math to back it up, and uh, mostly people who knew Ptolemy uh, saw these people who uh, were saying these kinds of unempirical claims as disgraces. Now, uh, they it's actually like when you get the right answer when guessing to a math problem. Uh, it's pretty weird. Anyways, uh, this one was accepted for a long time uh, and even idolized by the Catholic Church until this guy named Copernicus with some funky hair came up and said that the, the whole thing had changed and there was actually heliocentrism, which uh, called for the sun at the center of the universe. Now, obviously, the center of the universe notion was widely incorrect, but hey, uh, nobody knew about this very milky way yet. So uh, they thought everything was just the solar system and the comets, of course. So uh, there were also the stars outside the solar system, but rarely had anyone tried to theorize about that kind of stuff, uh, let alone discover a galaxy. So these were very, very old times. I mean, uh, I don't think the word milky was invented back then. So now this guy was co uh, named Copernicus, Nicolaus Copernicus to be exact, not Nicholas, Nicolaus with an U between the A and the F. So he said that the sun was at the center of everything. And that the, everything outside the solar system was orbiting around the sun. Now, this was largely supported by the Catholic Church at first until a group of angry, dumb, uh, protesting people decided to say, hey, we don't like this uh, guy because he breaks our illusions that we think the, uh, that the old Catholic Church was right. So we're going to uh, break this guy's illusions and we're just going to ban it. 
So, uh, they forced the church to ban his uh, revolutionary ideas. And indeed, uh, for almost a century, uh, people uh, uh, did not think of Copernicus as a uh, wide uh, Copernicus's theory of heliocentrism is a good idea. And uh, from the Catholic Church in secret and his peers, he was, uh, I believe, like encouraged to make a book, and so he did. In the last few weeks of his life in 1543, it isn't uh, known exactly when he died, and and uh, there were 400 copies of the book originally. N I, even to this day, uh, it didn't sell out. So it's obvious that not many people cared about his idea, but the few people that did were revolutionary. One of those people was the famous brass nose Tycho Brahe. You could even say he was Tycho Brahe. Uh, Alex Rodriguez, would you like to know why you named Tycho Brahe? Why? Uh, or uh, why he had a brass nose, I mean? Brass nose, no. Uh, in 1566, he had a very drunk duel with his friend, and third cousin about who was the better mathematician and accidentally got part of his nose cut off. <laughs> Obviously, they were still friends, but I'm pretty sure Brahe was angry about that. And Can I touch my nose just to make sure I have it? Yeah. And some people said that it was actually silver and gold, but an anatomy of the body uh, on revi revealed in 2010 showed well, what little fragments they had of Tycho Brahe's uh, prototype, and that it was actually brass, not silver or gold. Kind of a weird sidetracking there. But anyways, Tycho Brahe, in 1572, just uh, about six years after that drunken duel, they saw something revolutionary in the skies. It, there, we would call it a supernova or the birth of a star nowadays. But to them, it was revolution. Because the ancient Greeks, who thought everything was perfect, thought the stars were also immortal and that they could never change. And that nothing was to be born during that time. No stars were to change. Uh, however, when the new star just exploded and popped up into the sky, people were just, I don't know, man. Uh, and Nick, uh, Tycho Brahe indeed proved that this was something not uh, done by the atmosphere, but uh, indeed past our moon, which they would soon land on. Not soon, but rather in 400 years. And then, uh, this uh, guy named Galileo came up uh, going with, um, I believe, Tycho Brahe's ideas. And he, this guy said that everything was uh, actually rotating around the sun, which was great. People finally embraced Copernicus. However, there were still perfect circle orbits, which still had to account for these complicated epicycles uh, that Aristotle used. Oh, no, I meant Ptolemy used with his Earth-centric model, or geocentric model. <laughs> so, uh, if, in case you don't know, an epicycle, uh, there was something called this uh, uh, retrograde motion, uh, where for most of the time, uh, Mars is seen going east in the sky compared to the stars. But for about two or three months, Mars is seen uh, running backwards. Why? Well, imagine that they're spinning on a rope. So, if they were spinning on a rope uh, for a few uh, minutes, or in this case months, Earth would be uh, in the lead or behind uh, where Mars is seen traveling forwards or east but for a few uh, seconds or months we see that Mars taking the lead uh, Mars is 
uh, taking lead, or that's not Mars taking the lead, that's Earth taking the lead, and Mars is seen falling behind, and that's why West is going. Mm. Now, uh, sorry. So now, this was a problem, so Aristotle came up with a replacement for the old Mars kind of stuff. Not Ar Aristotle, although he also believed in heliocentrism. I mean geocentrism. Uh, so, uh, they invented this thing called epicycles, where the, uh, in place of Mars' is old positions, there was this unknown object, and Mars would be continuously rotating around this object all day long, which made for some seriously darn complicated stuff. Now, Copernicus had uh, got the exact same results uh, without any uh, sort of complicated epicycle stuff. And although Galileo's, uh, Galileo's orbits were still perfect circles, and so his theories were really perfected by this Kepler dude, but we're not going to look at him today. So now, Galileo, so that was Galileo, but he was also very, very punished by the Catholic Church because the Protestants forced him to, and he was sentenced to house arrest for most of his life. So, uh, however, this guy inspired some guy named Isaac Newton, or Sir Isaac Newton as we call him today. And he invented a little something called calculus, so, there was a guy competing for that that we may call a Leibniz, and he used that to track the orbit of the stars and um, use the first known theories of gravity. And that was also very revolutionary. However, there's one more thing I want to talk about before we leave off for this part of space travel. The Industrial Revolution fueled everything that we used to go get to the moon. So, uh, almost everything, but there was also some pure human innovation at work. So, the Industrial Revolution gave us mass production. And uh, with a thing called standardization, which people call, some people call the second industrial revolution, uh, brought, uh, worked like this. Nothing was made by hand anymore. Imagine screws where all the heads and bolts were of random different sizes. Or you had to buy different chairs of the same model to see if one of them fit through your door. That was a very tricky time. And now all of these would be produced the same way thanks to the uprise of machines that did everything consistently. So... Uh, that was uh, called standardization, and it paved the way for huge production of different things. Especially, uh, consistency took a lot faster time than the uh, differencing differences. So, people just instead of making robots or machines to differentiate and make parts for every single thing in one factory. They may, they probably made multiple factories, each constituting a single resource that needed to be made, much like we do today. We, we don't produce Oreo Little Bites uh, and uh, Cookie Chip Ahoy in the same factory, do we? Nope, they all have different factories for themselves. Not only because of the government, uh, I believe, but also because of the standardization or the second industrial revolution. Now, thank you everybody for watching. Uh, we'll go for the second part of space travel next time. And I'll see you next time on History. Bye!